Hello everybody and welcome to 97% Fire, the home of home recording. Now, what does John Bonham, Phil Collins and the Joshua Tree all have in common, apart from selling millions of albums? Well, it is that lots of their sound is based on room mics. So in this episode we're going to try and fit some room mics in the studio and we're also going to try and get rid of some microphone stands to create a bit more space for activities. Now, on this channel we don't like to name drop, even though I've worked with some of the biggest celebrities in the entire world. Hi, Alan Jones. Uh, but we haven't received this from Neil Mohan, the CEO of YouTube, in the post. <gasps> Look at that, amazing. Presented to 97% Fire, the home of home recording, for passing one, th that's all, 100 subscribers. Wooden, just like the presenting style. Now, pretend adulations aside, let's have a quick recap on the diffusers before we get into the studio. So just to pick up on where we left off last week with the acoustic panels, I believe I said that I was probably going to fit them in my office slash control room. Now the two little ones are probably going to go in my office slash control room. Oh, I thought that's what's going to happen. Anyway, as you can see here, I've attached two hooks to the very top of the back of the panels and then a batten to the ceiling, which has another two hooks on. And as you can see here via wobbly cam, I have hung the diffusers onto the batten and they are completely decoupled. So give it a push, mate, go on, push it. See, there you go. So you can see them waving backwards and forwards so that will reduce vibration and also help them diffuse in a diffusible style which is fantastic now the next thing to do is to rerun the sound reference id program and then we can compare the frequency response of the room before the buttons and the diffusers were fitted with the way the room reacts now left speaker Right speaker. Please adjust the volume of your output device. My voice should sound at normal conversation volume. Left speaker. Right speaker. So if you're not familiar with Sound Reference ID, episode number five of this series, which was one of the first 10 episodes for uni, explains it in great detail. But the thing we need to know is this. So this is the frequency response of the room before I fitted the diffusers that are made in the garage. And this is the one afterwards. Ah, ta-da! So as you can see, there is a difference. Uh, whether that's a good difference or a bad difference would depend on your room, what you're trying to do, all that sort of stuff. But at least we know what's happening. So we can add more stuff in my room. For instance, I have this huge, flat, shiny, reflective screen for the mixing desk, which is sort of directly in the path of that speaker, which is why I've got some of these bumps. But I kept it there because the previous um, recorded 
room calculation, it was there as well, so you can see. But if I was doing some high-level mastering, it might be better if I just used headphones rather than speakers, because this room is indeed just an office, and it's the only one I had available to me, and it's not really set up for golden ratios and that sort of stuff. But for what we're doing here at home, it works perfectly well. You can also open and close the door, which will make a massive difference. Uh, my calculation has worked out this is better with the door closed, so that's what I do. Right, on we go. So the real test with any type of calibration is to listen, not just to look at a graph. I can't actually play you what I'm listening to because, well, I'd have to pay Dr. Dre and Nurse Snoop Dogg a load of money. But the definition in clarity between the two... frequency response graphs is extraordinary for such a little change. So however the software works to make that a flat output in terms of frequency is really impressive. So definitely, definitely, definitely worth doing. Today's project is to try and get rid of, in as nice a way possible, as many stands and things cluttering the room as possible. We're going to try and achieve that using some wall mounted mics. So after a lot of trial and error I have come up with this. So what we're trying to do is fix this to the wall so we can have an XY or AB stereo set of mics above the kit like a room mic but without a stand. So originally I bought one of these little brackets here. The idea being to screw that to the wall and then somehow screw that to that. But I've actually found a better way after a bit of trial and error and it involves this. So this here is the original curtain bracket. Which happens to have happens to have the bracket that was taken off the wall, so the hole's already there, that's good. And then what I'm going to do is using these, these are worktop bolts. So if you have a worktop fitted in your kitchen, you have to join two together. Underneath, you might find some of these. But what they've got is this nut comes off and is completely, wait for it, wait for it. Uh, open, there we go. Cool, so the idea being, we'll clean this up, we'll attach that bolt to there, we'll then attach uh, that clamp to there, so that's got a square spline in it to stop it moving left and right, like so. We'll then Spin one of those down to lock it into place. That's fixed nice and solid. And then the second one, once that's on the wall and cleaned up, we can screw into place as well. Boom. Right. Let's see if that works. Look at that clean up first. You join me in the curtain rail speaker bracket clean up area. Ta -da! Now health and safety fans, if you thought that was really dangerous and I was going to rip my hands off, this is actually really, really gentle sandpaper. If you try that with 80 grit though, you might have to go to the emergency room. So that, in the middle of there, is where we want our freestanding mic stand. Oh, there's the finished article. I've done some little caps to neaten it up a bit. Now this should fit perfectly. Here is our finished bracket. I've put some clips on to make it a bit neater so we can have nice things. Now you'll see that the top screw is centered and the other two are in slightly different positions. So for this bracket, 
you need to put that in first. If you put another one in first, it won't line up. And then you'll have to delete that take and then pretend that it never happened when you put it up for the final YouTube shot. Ask me how I know. There's stuff like this. Always good to start all the screws off before you tighten anything down. So once I'd finally worked out which way up to put the bracket onto the ball, we tighten up the screws, replace the caps, and then we spin on the arm. Now, I thought I'd try a few different um, orientations of this, different mics to see what would fit and what wouldn't fit. Now, I've only got a selective few mics. I've got some 57s, some 606s. Uh, but what I really wanted to do is have an omnidirectional mic, as I don't have one of those currently set up as part of the studio. So that's what we ended up with in the end. This is of course completely configurable so we can try different stuff and then move it about and if all else fails it's just a nice place to hang your headphones. So there we have the finished for now wall mounted mic which means we can get rid of yet another mic stand. Uh, what have we got? We've got an uh, Biodynamic MC58 link. M58C. So that is a reporter's mic, if you've ever watched the news in the 90s or there onwards. That was the mic of choice for the BBC. I bought that microphone brand new when I made a documentary series that I recorded at Twycross Zoo, which was recorded in Binaural, and that was the infill reporter's mic. So that is sat in a drawer unused for the best part of 20 years it's omnidirectional which is why i've put it there and then above it i've got one of the spare tom mics and then that is firing directly at the kit so a couple of different choices there of course we can swap these out we can turn that sideways we can do x y we can do a b anything your heart desires we can also just we wanted to do some shotgun mics. We could hang that on now. It dips on the wall. So, cool. Right, next project. So the next project is indeed very close. And it's here. And once again, to try and get rid of some of the hardware in the room and to make it a bit neater, what I want to do is to find a better solution for this bass amp recording setup. So we have a DI lead coming off the back, and then we have an SM57 at the top. Uh, what's that, a D112 probably, AKG, somewhere at the bottom. And what I wanted to do, or what I managed to do, was to get the capsules, can you see, sort of in line, although that's in a bit at the minute, um, which is handy because it sounds nice when it's recorded. And it's not in phase. So I have been on to Jeff's online shop once again and bought the cheapest thing I could find, which is a new wire. And inside this box, let's use the tripod. Excuse me. <laughs> Professional videos. Right. Oh, it's going to be too complicated to open. Oh, there's a warranty void. So inside this professionally open box is move the camera, then everyone could see, couldn't they? That would make more sense. Yeah. Ta da! It's basically a microphone clamp thing. That should be, there you go, should be all adjustable. So I'm going to try and get rid of the bottom clamp here, I'll put that on there, and then hopefully that's another stand gone. Right, stand by. Now audio enthusiasts may notice that that is not the right mic stand for that. That is in fact a shotgun or little condenser pre-mount. Uh, when I bought that second hand, um, it didn't come with a stand, so I've adapted one of those. Works quite well. 
might start selling old second hand mic stands. So that goes there. Yeah, there we go, right, so. That's reason to that. Which means I need to take that one out of there because it's a different size. I must have one of every different size mic inserts in the entire universe. Because every time I go to do something, nothing fits. There should be a law. When I am king, heaven forbid, everything will have to be an M8 in the entire world with a 10 mil head for the nuts. Right, we're going to do this. So we probably want it something like something like that. Yeah, because that would give us loads of adjustment. Cool. Right. Ah, I didn't even have to move the top one. Cool. Right, let's zoom in. Probably can. So there we go. Nicely separated. Now I like to have my top speaker <laughs> split the difference of the cone and then the bottom one on the edge of the cone and then those three blending with the DI. Sounds lovely. Cool. You, you are out of here. Other space saving changes we have made is we have got rid of this supposedly SM7B microphone, which was going to be a hi-hat mic. Now, in the last video, I actually took this into the control room. I thought I'd use it as a voiceover to try and sound like a real YouTuber. And it is awful. It is full of static and noise and all sorts of stuff, which leads me to believe that even though it says sure, it may not have been made by the Shaw company. Because that was a present. Thank you for the present. Probably best off spending a tiny bit extra and buying a real one. Uh, so what have we done? Can you see it? Yes, there we have it. So we've got a tiny little mic there for the hi-hat, which actually sounds really good. Uh, we can use the same clamping technique to get rid of the far mic, which is pointing out the guitar cap. And then I'm going to try and use some more extra of these side arm things so you can have two symbols on one stand to try and get rid of some more bits and bobs. Right up until the point where I end up making computerized music with no instruments at all. Oh no, only joking, that would be terrible.